So welcome. We're going to dive into the Grants for Design Arts Projects opportunity. And we're going to cover some particular elements of the design application and some project examples, as well as addressing a few basics about the application process. We hope to conclude our presentation in 20 to 25 min minutes, leaving plenty of time for your specific questions or conversation at the end. So let's get started. Let's move on to the very first slide. I just always like to start these presentations um, with sharing out the most basic information about our agency. Xavier, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So we just wanted to share a little bit about um, the NEA. Uh, the NEA is an independent federal agency established in 1965. Here's a lovely um, shot of establishing the National Endowment for the Arts. And on the next slide, a little bit about us as an agency. We support the arts in all 50 states, the District of Columbia and US jurisdictions. We make roughly 2,300 grants annually, conduct research and execute arts, culture and design leadership initiatives. Through our programs, we encourage activities that rebuild the creative economy, educate the next generation, unite and heal our nation through the arts and serve the nation's arts field. We are committed as an agency to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and fostering mutual respect for the diverse beliefs and values of all individuals and groups. We have several different funding opportunities, but today we're gonna to focus on Grants for Arts Projects Program, affectionately known as GAP, in the design discipline specifically. Let's go to the next slide. The GAP Design Grant Program supports projects and programs in place-based designs, including, excuse me, in place-based design disciplines, including architecture, planning, urban design, and landscape architecture, as well as industrial design, fashion, and graphic design. So across these disciplines, we also welcome projects that focus on rural communities, inclusive design, and social impact design. Next slide. So at the NEA, we support a wide variety of project sizes from the very small to the very large. Projects can be an existing program that your organization produces or presents each year, or it can be a brand new activity. And just a reminder, we support projects in all 50 states, DC, and US jurisdictions. And projects may take place in communities of any size from rural to urban. A few additional notes about our project-based support. Projects may be up to a two-year period of support and applications may contain several components. So for example, if you're proposing a design exhibition you may also include related engagement or educational programming. All projects must be programmatically and physically accessible to individuals with disabilities in accordance with federal law. And while applications may focus on a particular constituency, they may not be exclusionary under federal anti-discrimination policies. So we're pleased to share that uh, more about NEA's compliance with civil rights laws Tomorrow, January 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we are hosting a webinar if you wanna get more into the weeds on that topic. So we'll just drop that into the chat for you all in case you wanna register. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Courtney. Hi everybody, and I'm gonna spotlight myself. Hi everyone, it's great to see you. Some familiar names and some, um, some new folks. Um, all right, uh, Xavier, next slide, please. Um, now we're gonna talk a little more about the specific kinds of projects that the design program generally supports. We think of them in two buckets, projects that have a public benefit and projects that advance or support the design field. Um, very often there are projects that overlap these two categories. So don't stress too much about trying to figure out exactly where your project fits. Um, it's really just a way for us to um, situate the work that the design program supports. Next slide, please. Digging in a little deeper into these buckets, 
Uh, projects that have a public benefit include commissions of new work in all design disciplines, including projects that foster positive social impact, employee inclusive design concepts, or foster collaboration between design and non-arts disciplines. Exhibitions, publications, or websites that share information about design or designers. Uh, design services for historic preservation or adaptive reuse projects that will serve arts and culture uses. Um, community planning and design related activities that serve communities and neighborhoods. And design competitions. For projects that have a public benefit, we encourage you to submit a letter of support as a demonstration of the community's desire for and engagement with the public benefit that your project is offering. And now next slide, we'll start to look at just a couple of examples. Um, on this slide, we're um, looking at uh, an image of, the, of the, the building for the Transform 1012 North Main Street project in Fort Worth, Texas. This grant will support a design competition and exhibition with proposals for the transformation of a former Ku Klux Klan auditorium in a space for, to become a space for arts and healing. Um, the exhibition will feature design competition finalist ideas for the building and allow for community input and discussion for the project as a whole. The grantee is the Wellman Project, uh, which is one of seven partners uh, in a coalition that represent groups targeted for violence by the Klan. Next slide, please. At the Museum of Arts, uh, sorry, at the Museum of Design in Atlanta, the NEA is supporting the exhibition Close to the Edge, the Birth of Hip Hop Architecture. The exhibition will feature the work of architects at the center of the hip hop architecture movement, offering Atlanta audiences insights into how these designers produce spaces, buildings, and environments that translate hip hop's energy into built form. The museum will collaborate with the architect and exhibition curator Siku Cook um, to present the exhibition, um, which debuted at the Center for Architecture in New York City. The project is particularly intended to benefit young people of color in the Atlanta area. And next slide. And now we're gonna look a little more closely at projects that advance and support the design field, including conferences and gatherings that promote innovation in design, design education or facilitate collaboration, designer residencies and workshops, design research or collaborative projects, education, mentorship, apprenticeship and outreach activities that teach design practices to American communities, projects that advance or sustain the creative work and careers of aspiring designers, projects that support emerging fields of design, and festivals and tours um, that raise awareness of, or programming that raise awareness of design. And a few projects that do that. Sorry, it's oops. Um, this example is uh, for the Landscape Architecture Foundation's Fellowship for Innovation and Leadership Program. The program enables comp competitively selected landscape architects, uh, sorry, landscape architecture professionals to develop and test landscape related social and environmental ideas. Fellows are provided funding and coaching along with time, structure, and resources for a year to explore a specific research topic that falls outside the boundaries of their day to day professional work. The program culminates in an annual symposium where fellows present their work. On the next slide, Design Trust for Public Space in New York will be conducting the Restorative City Conference, which will bring together design professionals, nonprofit organizations, and public agencies from across the country to share best practices and resources and work at the intersection of health equity and the built environment. The conference is the centerpiece of a multi year effort to demonstrate the ways that design can influence health and well being. Next slide. And finally, Down City Design in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, with a grant to support a series of free design education programs for middle and high school students. Through community engagement and hands-on training in planning, designing, and building small-scale structures and other site-specific installations, program participants will learn about the policies and other factors that shape their city and will increase their confidence that they can collaborate to make their community spaces more welcoming, functional, and attractive. The program will benefit participating Providence youth and their neighborhoods, many of which are underserved. So from these examples, you can see um, that design you know, funds a lot of different kinds of projects. If you'd like to see more of that, if you'd like to learn more about the projects we fund, uh, you can go to the recent grants page, which I'll paste a link for, 
Um, but we encourage you to, to look further into, um, into our other projects to kind of get a sense of, of um, where we sit. Um, Jen, I'll pass it back to you now. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so on the next slide, we talked a bit about the kinds of projects we can fund and support. So I just want to spend a minute on what we do not fund so that you don't inadvertently put forth an application um, or a project budget that has ineligible costs. So we have a full list of all the things we can support on our website guidelines at the unallowable activities costs link. But these are the things that come up most often in the design field. We cannot fund general operating or seasonal support. So if you were asking for 100% of your rent and mortgage and 100% of staff time, that would fall into general operating expenses. You can certainly include project personnel that are attributing percentages of their time for the project-based application you're putting forth to the NEA. Um, also, we cannot fund facility construction, purchase, or renovation. We can fund all sorts of design fees, planning work, all the way up through um, design construction documents. But actually putting shovels in the ground to build a structure or a facility is an ineligible cost. And lastly, um, we cannot fund the creation of new organizations. Um, so let's move on to the, to the next slide to speak a little bit about eligibility for applying. So applications to GAP are open to both new and returning applicants. In order to be eligible to apply, an organization must be based in the United States and must be a 501c3 nonprofit at the time of application a unit of state or local government, or a federally recognized tribe or tribal community. Most importantly, organizations must have completed three years of arts programming prior to the application deadline. You don't have to be a nonprofit for three years, but you do have to be able to demonstrate arts programming for the previous three years. GAP does not accept applications from individuals, including those submitted by fiscal sponsors on an individual's behalf. Through, um, though we love to see individual artists and designers that are compensated as part of a project or program. So put those design fee designer fees in your project proposals. And also commercial or for-profit enterprises are ineligible to apply. On the next slide, I just want to quickly flash this up, um, just making you aware applying for federal grants um, have requirements to abide by federal law. If you are awarded funding, it's key um, to keep in mind that an organization cannot discriminate or prevent participation in your program based on race, color, national origin, disability, age, and sex. So you wanna be thinking about this as you're putting together your application, you can certainly focus or target on a particular constituency. However, um, they may not be exclusionary under our federal anti-discrimination policies. Projects and programs supported by the NEA must also be accessible to people with disabilities. And depending on the nature of your project may be subject to the National Historic Preservation Act. And the NEA will conduct a review of your project to ensure it's in compliance. All right, so let me just quickly walk through how you navigate our website and find out where all these details and guidelines are. Here we are, arts.gov. Um, so from our homepage, you're going to want to expand the menu button. You can see that little orange arrow on the right and click on grants. Next slide, you're going to scroll down to the grants for organizations and select grants for arts projects. Next slide, this will take you to the gap landing page. So on the left, there's a sidebar with links to each section of the guidelines. We really encourage you to thoroughly review that information on these pages before beginning your application, but we're gonna just walk through some specifics quickly together now. On the next slide, um, you can see, find a full description, including the project types we discussed earlier. You wanna click on design right there um, on the artistic disciplines link on the left-hand sidebar and then click design. And that way you can navigate specifically to our design related grant guidelines and application materials. 
So Courtney, I'm going to send it back your way to, to keep us along this tour. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm going to dive a little deeper into the how to apply section. I've just pasted a link to that in the chat. Um, but specifically, and there's, there's a detailed webinar on this that you can also look at. So I encourage you to, to look there. Um, on this slide though, we're gonna, um, actually, if you can go to the next slide, Xavier, that would be great. Um, so in terms of how to apply, it's a three-step process, uh, two official steps, and then one that's really important as a pre-step. Um, first off, you need to register your organization with the System for Account Management, or SAM, um, as well as with grants.gov. SAM is the payment system for all federal grants. Um, and anytime you apply for federal funding, you have to go through SAM. Um, there are detailed instructions on that how to apply page on how to navigate that registration process. So I'm not gonna dive into that here. And there's also great resources. The SAM and, and grants.gov help desks are often super helpful. I won't say always, but uh, they are often really helpful. So we recommend you contact them if you're having issues. I can certainly try to help you, but a lot of times I'm, I don't have access to their systems. Once you've registered, uh, you'll be able to complete part one of the application uh, by submitting the application for federal domestic assistance short organizational form or the short form, um, which you'll submit through a workspace in grants.gov. Again, please use that how to apply page. There's a link on that page that will take you directly to the right place in grants.gov. So you don't have to search around to find the opportunity. Um, it's a very simple form. All you really need is contact information. We don't even ask you to fill out the project description or a title, because um, all of that you'll do in part two. Um, but it's super important that you meet that February 10th deadline. Um, unfortunately, it is not flexible unless you have issues that are SAM or grants.gov originated issues. Um, and so user error does not count, unfortunately. But if you don't make that February 10th uh, midnight deadline, you don't get to do part two. So please work ahead, plan ahead. Don't wait till the last minute on that if you can help it. And then part two of the application is the grant application form, which is uh, customized as an NEA specific form and that's submitted through NEA's applicant portal. Um, and it is really the kind of what I think of as the meat and potatoes, the substantial part of the application. Um, we did do a detailed webinar, as I mentioned last week, uh, on this, on going through the registration process and filling out these forms. So if you have issues, I definitely recommend watching that uh, webinar. I'll paste a link in the chat as well um, with those resources. Um, and this applicant resources page that I'm linking to right now is super helpful. There's a lot of good stuff in there, which we'll talk about more as we go forward. Um, next slide, please. So, Detailed instructions, and this is new, so if you've applied before, this is uh, something that hopefully will be really helpful. Um, we've now combined the detailed instructions for both part one and part two into a single PDF that's organized by discipline. So on that how to apply page, if you scroll down towards the bottom, you'll see something that looks like this where you have different artistic disciplines to link to. Um, we certainly hope you'll pick design um, and take a look at those guidelines. Part one instructions are the same for everyone, but part two is customized for each discipline based mostly around work samples and other, other additional pieces that you submit. Um, but you wanna make sure to look at the design guidelines there to make sure you're addressing all of our particular requirements. Um, next slide, please. Um, part two is, as I mentioned earlier, the grant application form. It's a web form that you access through the grant application portal, the NEA's portal. Um, and each section of the application is organized through a series of tabs, which you can see in the orange box at the top of the page here. Um, and then some of those tabs have sub tabs where you can see that first arrow on the left. Um, you'll navigate through each tab and sub tab to complete the application. Um, and for the narrative sections, there is a character limit listed at the bottom, which you can see an arrow pointing to uh, at the bottom of this page. Um, for all of these questions, along with additional guidance and character counts, they are all in that instructions PDF that we mentioned, that I mentioned a minute ago. So please download that. Um, while you won't be able to actually access the portal until the application window opens on February 15th, it's open for one week from February 15th to 22nd. Um, the instructions document provides details on what we ask for in each section of the application. Um, you can use that to draft your application before the portal opens. We encourage you to do that. Um, and don't wait till the last minute to copy paste your material into the portal. Um, it sometimes takes longer than you would expect. 
Um, I also encourage you to read the notes at the beginning of that part two instruction. Um, there's some helpful tips in there about how to make this process go as smoothly as possible. Things like putting your content into a text file instead of a word file and a lot of minutia that I won't go into here, but that those notes are really helpful to help smooth this process as much as possible. Next slide, please. All right, well, almost done presenting. Thank you for your patience. Um, we do have a few things we wanted to cover that we think will be relevant for everybody. Um, and uh, specific questions here, Xavier, first one is how should I think about the budget? Um, and uh, if you'll go ahead and click next, um, a couple of ways to think about this. One is to be remember that um, it's always a one-to-one -one match. And if you think of that as your half and NEA's half, um, that's kind of what a, a kind of a baseline way to think about it. So if you ask for $10,000, you need to show us $20,000 in costs. Again, your half and our half. Um, and you need to show us how you're going to meet that $10,000 match. You can do that a lot of different ways. It can be um, through in-kind or donated services. It can be through staff time. Um, it can be through uh, donations. It can be through other grants. Um, it can be um, service, uh, donated services and goods, volunteer time. Um, and you don't have to have all that finalized. You just need an idea of what those match how you're gonna meet that match. You do need to show that in the budget along with the amount you're requesting from us. Um, a lot of times you may have a project that's much bigger than an NEA amount and that's great, but you need at least a one-to-one -one in that costs in order to have an eligible application. Um, and also just make sure your costs in the budget align with the narrative and the scheduled activities. Think of it as sort of a neat triangle that tells us what your project activities are, why you're doing the project, kind of what's the story around that, and then what are the costs associated with that. So I think strict, think strategically about that. Um, the next question a lot of folks ask is how much should I ask for? Um, you can ask for up to 10, from $10,000 up to $100,000. If you ask for less than 10, we can't review your application. So ask for at least 10. Um, if you ask for more than 100, we'll review your application. Um, but I think just speaking frankly, the design average award is about $30,000. That's actually a little higher than the average for the agency. Um, we have a lot of smaller or medium-sized nonprofits that apply to this program. And um, we feel like those $30,000 grants are often really helpful for kind of medium-sized projects and programs. So um, that's kind of the average amount. You're certainly welcome to ask for a lot more than that. And um, we, you know, if you have a very highly ranked application, we might be able to give you a higher grant. Um, but just keep in mind that kind of average is 30, not 60. Um, and then finally, on, on this slide, how likely is it my project will be funded? Um, design awards 50 to 60% of our applications each year. So you have a pretty good shot at it. And then next slide, um, just a few other things to think about. Um, first and foremost, our work samples, uh, particularly for design, I think visuals and um, sometimes videos, sometimes audio, but certainly visuals are really important. Um, they add color and texture and character to what is otherwise an all text document. So I would encourage you to think strategically about your work samples. How can they add to the narrative that you've written? How can they give a sense of what a place looks like or feels like or you know, what a product or a garment or whatever the focus of your project is, if it's community engagement activities, what does that community look like? Um, how can you give us um, kind of more character uh, that goes beyond that um, text document, which is obviously super important, but um, can be a little dry for the panelists sometimes. The next thing to think about really is just the art of design. Um, we see a lot of projects um, which are collaborative. Design obviously is infused in so many other disciplines and other um, or types of work in the world, in business and health. Um, and that's wonderful. And it's a, great, it's a great thing that design has those connections with so many different um, fields. But this is the National Endowment for the Arts. And so I think being strategic and thoughtful about where design is evident and strong in your particular project, even if it is collaborating outside the design field, is really important. Um, and then finally, a note really just on simple grantsmanship, um, be super clear on who's gonna benefit from your project, what are the activities, and why this project, why right now, and why federal funding? This is, this is your tax dollars at work. So you don't need to say, I wanna spend my tax dollars this way, but it's really important that it's clear that federal funding is the, an appropriate pot of money to support the nature of the work that you wanna do. 
with that, I will pass it back to John for just a very little bit more about our design review process. Great. Um, great questions so far coming in the chat. And we're going to turn to those in a minute. Um, but just wanted to lift up some awareness of our timeline. Note, the design grants for arts projects has only one single deadline, um, which is February 10th, 2022. Some of our other disciplines have two deadlines. So I just wanted to lift that up so you don't miss it. So what happens with your application? You apply, get your grants.gov part one submitted February 10th, 2022. You then do your grant application form, which is the part two deadline between February 15th and 22nd, but you can certainly prepare those questions well in advance as Courtney lifted up. We then conduct a panel process. So you are actually reviewed and the applications are adjudicated by a panel that is um, representative of diverse design disciplines, communities, um, architects, urban designers, landscape architects, fashion designers, industrial designers, communications designers, a really diverse mix of design folks who are reviewing applications, as well as one layperson, so someone who um, is representing the broader American public, but is not employed in the design field. After that, we make recommendations, follow the guidance of the ranked list that our panels uh, lift up. It goes to the National Council for Approval in October. You are notified um, in November of 2022, and your project can begin. Earliest start date is January 1st, 2023. So just want to have you thinking about your project in the context of this timeline. All right, and the next slide. Um, just some things we want to leave you with. So who are the NEA design panelists? People just like you. Uh, design practitioners, I sort of hit on this, academics, nonprofit leaders and staff, and that single layperson. We hit all design disciplines. We have diversity in geography, race, ethnicity, experience. And we have two or three panels per cycle. We invite you, if you are interested in serving on NEA design jury duty, which we like to affectionately call that, send us an email, share your bio, so um, we have you on our radar to have you volunteer. And if you want to see our past panelists, you can look at them under our recent grants. You can see all the past design panelists to just get a sense for who those folks are. Next slide, please. So here we go. Here are just some application resources to leave you with. Um, we talked about just a couple highlights from our grant portfolio. You can take a look at all our recent grants, I think for the last decade or two under our recent grant search. We have sample application narratives also up online. So if you wanna see the really strong applications that were awarded for funding, um, there's some great samples up there. And if you wanna just be in touch with us, um, sign up for our newsletter. We send it out roughly once a month, sometimes every other month, depending on when there are really newsworthy things happening in the program to keep you up to date of open application deadlines, award announcements, et cetera. And I think it's just worth noting beyond grants, the design program is up to a lot of other things in supporting the field. Um, we recently released a disability design report back in the fall. So if you are working at that intersection, have interest in that space, I encourage you to check that out. We have a link up here on the screen as well. So with that, um, I think we're going to close out and move into questions. Feel free to follow our agency. Um, stay in touch that way. But I think with that, we can stop recording.